welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. All right, got your Bibles. I want to talk to you tonight about the power of the Holy Spirit. Everybody shout out loud the word power. Oh, that was awesome. Say it again, please. Power. Oh, let's do it for a third time. Power. Marvelous. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll know it. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus speaking. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. At 15 years of age, I got saved, and many of you know the story. I got saved every Sunday night for three years. <laughs> Billy Graham came to town, and I got saved five more nights. <laughs> I had a heart for God. Didn't understand everything, just chasing God. They announced they were going to have a water baptismal service. I didn't have any understanding of it, but they were going to have it. I've since observed in the New Testament that Christianity is an experience followed by teaching. Today we try to get teaching than the experience. Not against teaching. So they, they'd had a thousand first time decisions for Christ in the next year after I got saved. Nothing to do with me. So once a month they'd rent a public swimming pool on a Saturday morning and baptize converts. Up to 400 converts. Saturday I was there, 200. And as I'm standing there, I'm watching them getting baptized. And a phenomena was happening. They would put them down. Thank God, bring them up. <laughs> and then the people would throw their hands in the air fall backwards and would be laying on their back on the water with their hands in the air. Speaking in what I thought was a foreign language. And I said to the pastors, I can't do that. I know if I put my hands up laying on my back, I'll sink. And I don't know the language. Finally, they're just about at the end when one of the pastors yells at me, get in. So I get in, they baptize me. And the next thing I remember, my feet were going down and touching the bottom of the pool. And I too had been laying on my back with my hands in the air, having an experience with God. Supernatural, supernatural. I go to church Sunday night, and they said, what do you want? I said, what, I got at baptism. What was that? I don't know, but it felt good. <laughs> I know some churches you go out of and you don't feel good. Next Sunday night, what do you want? What I got last Sunday night, what was that? Well, well I don't know, what I got at baptism. And the pastor said, you need the Holy Ghost. All right, give it to me. 
We was ignorant, man. <laughs> My mother jumps up and says, let somebody else get it. <laughs> they prayed for me. Evidently, I went down under the power of God on the floor, never having seen it before. No CD, courtesy drop. <laughs> Evidently, they carried me out of the building at one o'clock in the morning, shouting in other tongues. Couldn't drive home. Threw me on the bed. When I got up in the morning, every time I opened my mouth for the next 24 hours, out would come this new language. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Had a visitation of God. He came to me. And he said, you're going to be an evangelist. Well, I didn't know what an evangelist was, but it was a long word, so I thought it was good. You're going to preach around the world. Tens of thousands of people a night on occasions will come to Christ. Thousands will get healed night by night at times. And a man will come from the United States of America and release you in around the world ministry. That turned out to be John Osteen. Amazing. I went from being a young man full of fear and inferiority to somebody all of a sudden who had power over those things and knew what he was going to do with the rest of his life. There are two Greek words translated power in the New Testament. You'll know them. One is exousia, which means power released under authority. The second one is dunamis, explosive power. Also translated, miraculous might, ability, mighty deed, miracle strength, virtue, worker of miracles. Dunamis is inherent power capable of action. Power in action. Power released under authority is potent. Without authority, it is dangerous. We cannot be an authority unless we are under authority. God is not into, into uh, God, sorry, God is not into independence. He's into interdependence. Kathy and I have had to pick up the pieces of men and women that had incredible power but were independent and wouldn't come under authority and crashed and burned. We get three English words from the word dunamis, power. The first one is dynamics. A branch of physics dealing with force Producing or affecting motion. Second one, dynamo. A dynamo converts mechanical energy into electrical power. And the third one is dynamite. A highly explosive force such as nitroglycerine. In Acts 1.8 it says, our reading, you shall receive dunamis, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
In Luke 24, 49, he talked about the fact we will be endued with power, dunamis. There's special emphasis on Luke 24, verse 49, because the last words of a dying person are incredibly important, and these were the last words of Jesus before his ascension, and he's saying, you need the power, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, when I read it, I discover two things. Number one, God is a God of love, but he's also a God of power. Number two, people received his power through the Holy Spirit. God wants to demonstrate to the world his mighty, powerful, miracle-working, supernatural power through his believers. This power, this dunamis, is living and abiding and residing within you and I if we're filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know why, but for some reason, many of us have got the idea that it's only the people behind the pulpit that have this tremendous power when in fact the Bible teaches it's every believer. You have the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. Come on. When something goes wrong at home, don't go, oh God, what are we going to do? You've got dunamis. Use it. Oh, call the church. Well, that's all right. But you've got the dunamis of the Holy Spirit, the power of God living and abiding within you. When something happens to your children, I'm trying, dear. <laughs> Come on, something happens to your kids. Oh, God, what are we going to do? Wake up. You've got the dunamis of the Holy Ghost in you. You can pray over them. You can believe God just as easy as I can or anybody else. Many years ago, when I was pastoring in New Zealand, we went to a city to start a one-week series of meetings and got there Saturday morning and we're walking around downtown, the stores and everything. And, and I see a young man walking toward me. And the Holy Spirit says to me, I want you to minister to him. So I waited till he crossed the road. I go up to him and I politely introduce myself to him and tell him that I feel like the Holy Spirit would like me to minister to him. Is that all right? And he goes, yes. Well, even if he'd said no, I was going to do it. <laughs> and I said, this is what I feel God is saying. You've been a missionary. You have fled the country that you were a missionary in because you saw an incredible demonic manifestation. You, had it, you feared it. You ran. You caught a plane home to the city of Auckland. You caught a bus down here because nobody would know you. But God knows you. And he told me to tell you your ministry's not over. He told me to tell you, you'll end up back on the mission field. Come on, hallelujah. 
He asked me what I was doing. I said, I'm doing some meetings. He asked if he could come, and he comes every night to the meetings. Friday night, the last night, he says, where's your church? I said, well, it's in another city. Well, can I attend that? So yes, Sunday he shows up at church. The next Sunday, his sister from another city shows up. She gets saved, baptized in water, filled with the Holy Ghost all in the same night. I like that. For three years, we had baptism service every Sunday night, <laughs> baptizing the converts. A week later, there's a knock on my door. I open it, a young man standing there dressed in motorcycle leathers. He yells at me, what have you done with my girlfriend? Well, you know who he's talking about, but I didn't. I said, who are you talking about? He describes it all. Oh, I said, her. He said, yeah, she came up to see her brother, and she's not coming home. I said, then you ought to hang around and find out what she got that's so good that she ain't going to go home. He comes to church Sunday night, gets saved. Baptized in water, filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, hallelujah. He only knows two people in town, his ex-wife and her boyfriend that are living together. He goes and tells them what's happened. They come to church. They get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in water. Uh, you'll understand this. I've got a classical Pentecostal church I'm pastoring. On the front row, I've got this ex-missionary, his sister who was living with this guy that I now saved, his ex-wife and her boyfriend who are living together, and some of the old people that were built in with the bricks in my church. <laughs> they say, to me, Pastor, you got to deal with that. They're in sin. I go, I know. Well, do something. I ain't doing nothing. You can't, we can't have them in church like that. Yes, we can. Do something, pastor. I ain't doing nothing. Because it's not my job to convict them of sin. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Come on. And when the Holy Spirit does it, he does it good. Yeah. Oh, they're bringing people in all, all, every Sunday. We're getting people saved. It's, it's wonderful. One day I get a call from the ex-wife. She says, I hate you. <laughs> I'm not living with you. <laughs> I hate God. What's going on? My boyfriend. What? He got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, evidently. Writes me a note. We are living in sin. The Holy Spirit has convicted me. I've got to go. Didn't even wake her up and tell her. Just flies the coop. Come on. Hallelujah. She takes off. We don't know where she is. Gone. One day her ex-husband comes to me and says, Pastor Alan, said, yeah. he said, something weird's happening. I said, what? He said, I'm falling in love with my ex-wife. I said, you know where she is? He said, no, that's what's weird. And the other weird thing is I used to hate her. <laughs> he said, this is weird, man. <laughs> so we were having a marriage seminar the next week. I mean, we had all these young people. I figured they may as well learn about getting married before they got married rather than after they got married. Yeah. So on the last night of the seminar, this couple get up and say, we're going to speak about what to do when you remarry your ex-spouse. I'm sitting there thinking, this is ludicrous. 
most of these are not even married. So they're teaching on it. I've never heard anything on it before or since. About a third of the way through, one of my pastors elbows me and he said, guess who just walked in? I said, I don't know. Well, stand up and have a look. I ain't stand up and have a look. <laughs> that girl walked in, sat in the back row. Six weeks later, I married her to her ex-husband. <laughs> Come on, hallelujah. I'm telling this story in New Zealand a few weeks ago, and all of a sudden I hear, yeah, that's right, out of the crowd. And it was him. <laughs> the welfare, that's the government department, on the Monday after the wedding called them and gave them back their kids that have been taken because of their drug abuse. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Well, listen to this. The guy I ministered to ended back on the mission field in New Guinea with a phenomenal revival. It's historic. I don't know what happened to his sister except I have heard she's going on with God. But her boyfriend just started serving God in the local church as a leader. His wife, who used to be his ex-wife, became a huge Christian songwriter. The guy she used to live with pastored one of our largest churches in Australia. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because of something we didn't know. No, no, no. Here's what I'm telling you. You never know when you do something under the power of the Holy Spirit where it's going to finish up. Come on, hallelujah. You never know what's going to happen. You can just minister to somebody something simple and it can have incredible worldwide ramifications. You're filled with the dunamis, the power of God. Jesus received the Holy Spirit when he was baptized at the River Jordan. And after that, he started performing the miraculous. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 21. In, in uh, verse 1, it says, He's led into the Spirit. He's fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He overcomes the devil who tempts him personally three times. Verse 14, it says, He returns in the power of the dunamis of the Holy Spirit. In verses 18 to 21, he announces what he's going to do. He's going to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, open blind eyes, preach the gospel to the poor. Come on, are you hearing me? That's what happens when you come in the power, the dunamis of the Spirit. In Luke 4, 36, it says, With authority, exousia, power, dunamis, Jesus commanded unclean spirits to come out, and they came out. Luke 5, 17, it says, And the power, the dunamis of the Lord was present to heal them. Luke 9, 1, Jesus called his disciples together and gave them power, dunamis, and authority, exousia, over all diseases and to cure all, sorry, over all demons and to cure all diseases. Acts 6 verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, dunamis, did great wonders and miracles amongst the people. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4, Paul said, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power dunamis. If I didn't have this dunamis in my life and ministry, I would wonder what is wrong. Going back to our reading in Luke 24, verse 49. 
He said, you shall be endued with power. That word endued in the original Greek language is the same word as clothed. It has a meaning in this scripture of speaking, uh, sorry, of stepping into clothing. So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are endued, we step into the clothing, we are clothed with the dunamis of God. He is in us and over us. We are now divine representatives. In Acts 1.8, the word power, dunamis, not just inherent power, but power possessed. A divine capability that can be ministered in different forms. Power for service, power to live, power for speech, power for miracles, power for wisdom, power for knowledge, for teaching, or whatever it is needed for. We are clothed with dunamis. Well, I don't feel like it. It don't matter. Come on, it don't matter. It don't matter. I know that's bad English, but it don't matter. You're clothed with dunamis. You don't have to feel like it for it to be there. Let me tell you something. I'm married. Somebody say, thank God. <laughs> Some days, I don't feel like I'm married. I'm just married. Come on, are you there? It's not a feeling. I'm married. Let me look at you guys. You understand what I'm saying? You don't have to feel like you're married to be married. If you're married, man, you're married. That's it. It's not a feeling. When you fill with dunamis power, you don't have to feel like it. It's there. It's there. It's there. And that means you have the power to overcome. You have the power to rise up. You have the power to be more than a conqueror. You have the power to do the miraculous. You have the power to overcome devils and demons. You have the power to succeed in this world. This is not an arrogant statement, although one or two will probably say it is, but it's not. I am filled with the dunamis, the power of God. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. You are filled with the dunamis, the power of God. The church is meant to be a supernatural church. If it's only moving in the natural, it is out of order. We have too many low-impact, high-maintenance believers. <laughs> Come on, are you hearing me? I say that all right, bro? <laughs> Too many low-impact,
impact, high maintenance believers. When all the time we're filled with the dunamis, the power of God. And we ought to be high impact, low maintenance believers. This dunamis is a present, personal, powerful reality. It is not merely a doctrine or an influence only from God. You are filled with the Holy Spirit and you have the dunamis, the power of God in you. Hallelujah. You have dynamite in you. Let's stand together, please. You may put your Bibles down. You may put your purses down. We have to say that to the guys nowadays. <laughs> How you doing, man? Take your right hand and hold it up. Take this finger, point it at yourself. Say this out loud after me. God, I belong to you. I'm one of yours. I'm filled with you and your Holy Spirit. Therefore, I am filled with the dunamis the power of God and I can do the impossible I can overcome I can conquer because I do have the dunamis the power of God living and abiding and residing within me Amen We have talked about the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. But you can't have that unless first you're saved. Can't have it unless you're saved. And we want to pray for the greatest miracle that can happen to a human being tonight. That is the miracle of Jesus Christ coming into your heart, into your life, and washing all of your sin away. So what are you talking about? Every person's born into this world with an inherent nature of sin because of the fall of Adam and Eve. You, me, and everyone else. But God said, I'm not going to leave you there. I will make a way of escape for you. So his son Jesus went to the cross and on the cross he took the sin of all humanity upon himself. And he said, if you'll open up my heart, your heart and your mind and invite me in, I will come into your life spiritually. I will wash all of your sin away and you will be connected to me and I'll be connected to you. At this point, people start making excuses not to do it. They say, well, I don't want to be religious. We don't want you to be religious either. We're against religion. Christianity is not a religion in spite of what some people have done to it. Christianity is about relationship. 
You say, well, I've got my church. We're not talking about your church. We're talking about receiving Jesus. Well, my family, man, they all go to church. No, 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 no. That might happen, but that doesn't mean that Jesus is in your life. For nobody can make this decision for you. You have to make your own choice and your own decision about this. Well, I'll go home and think about it. That's just a very nice way of saying no. Well, I'm doing the best that I can do. It's not about what you're doing. It's about who you invite into your life and what He does within you. Well, I think I'm a Christian. I hope I am. If you only think you are, if you only hope you are, the reality is that you probably are not one. For if you were one, you would never say, I think so or I hope so. You would be able to say, I know so. And there's absolutely no doubt about it. So tonight, I want to pray for the youngest to the oldest. I want to pray for people that maybe are visiting for the first time or you've been here two or three times before or maybe become a regular attender. Say, Al, I need to know that my sin's washed away. I need to know that I belong to God and God belongs to me. I need to know that He is my Savior. And in order for me to pray for you tonight, I'm going to ask you to respond by simply raising up your hand, letting me see it, and putting it down so we can pray for that for you. Would you do that right now? Just raise your hand. Hold it up. Let me see. It's a bit hard with the lights to see. Over here, over here, way up the back, way upstairs, down here, over here, way up the back there again. Just keep raising your hands over here, over here, up the back there, down here. You may put your hands down. Are there others of you right now? The Spirit of God is speaking to you. Say, Al, I need Jesus. This is my night. I need to come and give my life to Christ. I need to know that I belong to Him and He belongs to me. And I need you to pray for me. If you haven't already raised your hand, Would you just put it up right now? Just put it up all over the building. Others of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 down the front. Over here, yeah. Others of you. Let's stand together, please. I want you to listen to me, please. Don't move until I've finished. If you raise your hand tonight, we're going to ask you in a moment to take the next step, to push past the people in your aisle, walk down the various aisles to the front, standing here facing me. You say, do I need to come? If it was worth raising your hand, it's worth coming down here. Jesus went all the way to the cross for you and I. A few steps down here will not hurt you. It will help you. And the Bible is very clear. If we confess Jesus publicly, He will confess us before His heavenly Father. And please understand, we're not against you, we're for you. And most of us have made this decision somewhere, sometime. If you need somebody to come with you, grab somebody and say, come with me. If you brought somebody politely and kindly, invite them to come and come with them. But I'm going to ask every person that raised their hands and others all over this building to step out of your seats right now, walk down the aisle, stand in the front facing me so we can pray for you. Come on, every one of you that raised your hand. Here they come. Here they come. Come on. Won't you come? Come on. Just as Keep you coming. Are. Oh, and here the 
Come on, Holy Ghost. Keep coming. That's it. From up to the back there. That's it. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's it. Thank you, Ashes. Fantastic. Beautiful. Beautiful. I want to pray for you tonight. And you can still come if you want to come. I want to pray that Jesus comes into your life and washes your sins away. After we pray for you, we're going to get you to follow this pastor over here, waving his hand at you. And he's going to take you into a side auditorium for a few moments. They're going to pray with you, get you to fill out a decision card, give you some literature to help you on your journey. For this is not the end. This is the beginning of an experience that will last the rest of your life. That's it. Come on. Come on. Yeah, bless you. Let's pray. I'm going to pray this prayer. I'm going to ask everybody at the front to repeat it each line out loud after me, inviting Jesus into their heart and life. And I'm going to invite the entire crowd to pray it super loud with them. Are you ready? Sorry, are you ready? Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight. And I thank you for this opportunity to receive you into my life. I confess to you now that I am a sinner and I need you. I ask you to wash all of my sin away. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to become my Savior. I thank you now, Lord Jesus, that you are hearing and answering my prayer. You are now coming into my life. You are now washing my sin away. I now belong to you. You belong to me. You are now my Savior. And I am now your child. I thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. People often ask me, why do you look at everybody? You know why I look? I look them right in the eye. Because I wonder on which altar call will be somebody that will become a history maker and a world changer. Come on, hallelujah. Somebody that will change their city, maybe their nation or the world. All of you guys at the front, would you be so kind not to go back to your seats, but follow this great gentleman over here. Let's give him a hand as they go. Welcome, dear. You're welcome.